What does Grand Central Station, Kansas, the heiress, and Marie Antoinette have in common? Très désolé. The last episode of The Gilded Age. Hey everyone, this is D, Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, of course, I am coming to you all with another episode of The Gilded Age. Season 1, Episode 9, our season finale, Let the Tournament Begin. This episode was directed by Michael Engler and written by Julian Fellows. So we open up this episode with Marion. We see her rushing off to Miss Chamberlain's and she quickly informs her of her plans to elope with Tom. And she also requests the use of her home to meet Tom on the day of. Mrs. Chamberlain takes it a step further. She is even willing to provide a carriage to take them to Grand Central Station. Marion is surprised, but Mrs. Chamberlain tells her that she has no fear of scandal. She's a walking scandal already. She's got a point. Marion figures once they're married, they can come back to New York and see how the land lies. But then again, they could really live anywhere that they wanted to. But like so many others, even Miss Chamberlain doesn't believe that Tom will give up New York quite that easily. Marion tells her that she's wrong and that society means as little to Tom as it does to her. I was like... Next, we see Bertha making the final preparations for Gladys' social debut. Then we see her headed off to Mrs. Astor's home. But unsurprisingly, Mr. Hefty, the butler, informs her not once, not twice, but three times that Mrs. Astor is not home. But in this case, not at home is code word for I don't want to see Bertha. (laughs) Because before she can leave, she sees Mrs. Randolph being welcomed into the house by Mr. Hefty. Quite the slap in the face. But as always, Bertha is prepared. She informs Gladys that Carrie will no longer be invited to the ball. Besides, it doesn't make much sense to have Carrie attend the ball if her own mother won't even receive Bertha. And even worse, the same goes for all the other young men and women participating in the quadrille. Gladys, Larry, and even George are shocked by this turn of events. But this is Bertha we're talking about. And in this house, what Bertha says goes, no matter how counterintuitive it might be. We also see Peggy, who stops by the Van Ryan household to collect her remaining belongings. And she and Marion have a quick conversation about their lives going forward. Most importantly, Marion convinces Peggy to smuggle her bag out for her. However, that plan hits a rough patch when Ada recognizes the bag as Marion's when Peggy is leaving out. Ada does her best to convince Marion of not making the mistake of eloping with Tom, but as always, Marion is quite determined to stay the course. Then, in a very surprising scene, we see Carrie Astor confronting her mother about her snub of Bertha and the consequent rescinding of her invitation. I mean, never mind all the several weeks she spent working on the dance. Ultimately, Carrie has realized that her mother knew that if she snubbed Bertha, that she would most likely drop Carrie from the event, which is quite premeditated and also quite foul. So Carrie chooses to retaliate by barricading herself in her room and refusing to communicate, socialize, or travel with her mother. Then we see Monsieur Baudin speaking to George about a serious matter that may result in his dismissal. Now, this is coming on the heels of Baudin reading a letter earlier in the episode, which he had a very strong reaction to. And in what might be one of the biggest twists in this entire show, we discover that Monsieur Baudin, the French chef, It's just a farm boy from Kansas. (laughs) One who became a merchant seaman and found a job washing dishes in Cannes, France. But naturally, once he returned to New York, he realized that no one was in need of a chef from Wichita, Kansas. And so, since French chefs were all the rage, he transformed himself into Monsieur Baudin instead of Josh Borden. I mean, (laughs) there are no words. And the only reason that all this is coming out now is that his wife has tracked him down and wants to reconcile, especially hearing how well he's doing. 
which would explain the woman that he was arguing with in the last episode and the letter that he received in this one. Now, George doesn't really see the big deal, especially if the food is the same. But Bertha is not about to provide the women of old New York society ammo to make her the laughing stock of the entire city. Bodan slash Borden has got to go. And as far as the ball is concerned, she'll simply have to outsource another chef in his place. Why am I getting a bad feeling about this? We then see Borden explaining the whole messy affair to the staff. And everyone is confused as far as how he can still sound French when he's not. Apparently, after all this time, it's hard to break the habit. But church figures, maybe you should try. So finally, Borden speaks for the first time. And when I tell you, this is one of the few times that I wish that I actually did reaction videos to episodes and TV shows. Because when that man opened up his mouth, I was like, oh, the horror. <laughs> Listen, I understand we all come from different places. We have different dialects and accents and ways of speaking and, you know, vocal cords and tones and all that. But when that man started talking, I was like, yikes. <laughs> Which I suppose is just as well, because after a few seconds of talking, he completely slips right back into his French accent to the complete confusion and bewilderment of the staff. <laughs> Later, we see Bertha having a conversation with Carrie, who was hanging out with Gladys. Bertha does regret the circumstances, but she tells Carrie that she is welcome in the house any other time. But Carrie has a proposition. Would you forgive my mother if she apologized? Bertha doesn't think it likely, but of course. Next, we see the new chef, Monsieur Charon, being introduced to the staff. And to make a long story short, he's quite rude. He completely ignores the preliminary work that Bodin has already left to help prepare for the ball. And he even goes so far as to suggest that Bertha will simply take what he gives her. I sense disaster ahead. Oh. And speaking of disaster, Aurora spots Tom with Miss Bingham at the Academy of Music, and they look more than a little chummy together. Ironically, this is happening just as Marion and Ada are sharing a tearful goodbye. But before Marion leaves for good, she hands off a letter to Larry and requests that he deliver it to the Van Ryan household at 7 p.m. that evening. Larry is fine with this, as long as it isn't indicative of some desperate action she's suddenly taken. Marion says, actions, yes. Desperate, no. I said, somebody told a lie one day. Aurora then tells Ada what she saw at the academy, and without any additional explanation, Ada urges Aurora to head to Mrs. Chamberlain's home, ASAP. We also see George meeting with a gentleman named Mr. Kuiper, who wants an extension on his loan by a million dollars and a year longer to repay. George is perfectly fine with this, but as usual, it comes with a stipulation. This time it comes in the form of an invitation for Mr. Kuiper and his wife to Bertha's ball. Furthermore, should Mr. and Mrs. Kuiper not attend the ball and then attempt to go elsewhere for the loan, George will simply send them the reason why they shouldn't invest. I mean, is it fair? Of course not. But then again, when has George Russell ever played fair? And next, we see that hell has clearly frozen over because we see Mrs. Astor, yes, the Mrs. Astor, walking up the steps to Bertha's home. We can clearly see from Church's face that he is quite shocked by this new development, and so is Bertha when he informs her. So, here it is. The woman that Bertha has sought out from day one all the way to now is officially standing in her drawing room. Mrs. Astor assures Bertha that there's no reason to fall out, and she gives a pretty BS explanation for why she didn't receive her. Bertha wasn't born yesterday, and she knows that Mrs. Astor's visit is simply a hollow gesture to placate Carrie. And the only way to fix it 
is to attend the ball with Carrie and also inform others that she'll be attending. This includes Agnes and Ada because Bertha is tired of being cut on her own doorstep. Otherwise, there's nothing much to talk about. And similar to Mrs. Morris back in episode three, she informs Church that Mrs. Astor is leaving. <laughs> you can tell that Mrs. Astor was not prepared for this turn of events, but Carrie had already warned her that Bertha was not the weak woman that Mrs. Astor had taken her for. And Mr. McAllister all but confirms this when he has a brief meeting with Mrs. Astor, and he assures her that if she attempts to beat Bertha at her own game, it may come at the expense of her dignity, which Mrs. Astor translates as, I really, really want to go to the ball. <laughs> the same cannot be said for Agnes when she and Ada receive a request from Mrs. Astor herself to attend Bertha's ball. Agnes doesn't understand the purpose of being asked to march into hell and dance with the devil. Ada says, I wonder if sometimes you don't slightly overstate your arguments. I said slightly. <laughs> Next, we see that Aurora has finally made it to Mrs. Chamberlain's and informed Marion of her discovery. Marion, once again, is in extreme denial, especially considering that Tom should have arrived hours ago. So Marion figures she'll go to Tom's office and see if she can find him there. And it's really interesting the way this whole piece played out. It really reminded me of this old school Hollywood film called The Heiress. It was made in 1949 and it stars Olivia de Havilland. And there are some really interesting dynamics as far as this woman who falls in love with this man and how that story plays out. It's not exactly the same, but I can still see some very obvious parallels between the two. She does find Tom there and the whole situation plays out almost the way some of us have suspected, minus the whole stock piece. Tom has gotten cold feet. He has become fully immersed in the culture and the society in the ballrooms of New York. And he also realizes that Miss Bingham can offer him a life that Marion simply can't. By this point, Marion had already figured that out, but she was acting against her own self-interest. And before she can wallow in the sadness of this revelation, she realizes that she has to go and retrieve the letter from Larry before it's too late. But thankfully, she's able to retrieve the letter quite literally in the nick of time. And considering all the trouble that Marion has now put him through, Larry then requests a waltz at the ball that Marion will now be attending. Surprise, surprise. Mrs. Astor finally admits defeat. Well, at least with Carrie. Because she realizes that with Carrie's father rarely at home, she can't afford to go through her day-to-day -day without her only daughter. Over at the Scott household, Ellen the maid hands Dorothy a letter from her husband's jacket pocket. She's had to remove it in order to do the laundry. Dorothy then reads the letter, and she is shocked by what she discovers. She shows Peggy the letter, which is postmarked from Philadelphia. We discover that Peggy's long-lost son is in fact alive and that Mr. Scott has been making inquiries into his upbringing for a while now. Naturally, Peggy is overcome with emotion and she knows just one thing. She wants her son back. Finally, the moment that we have all been waiting for is here. Everything officially kicks off as George says, let the tournament begin. <laughs> Listen, I am not going to lie. When we see that outside shot of their home and the red carpet and that line going around the side of their house, I got so hyped seeing that because I guess we have really gone through the journey from the beginning. We saw how things played out in that first episode. And so seeing that this is really happening and that like people are really here, like a bunch of people, seeing all the people being presented, hearing their names being called and the lobby filling up, like, I mean, hey, like Bertha or not, I couldn't help but be happy for her. Oh, and speaking of those presentations I was talking about, things get quite tense when Watson makes his way through the lobby and he hears Mr. and Mrs. Robert McNeil being announced. 
And in a not so surprising turn of events, Monsieur Sharon falls completely flat. And I mean that literally, as in he gets so drunk that he falls flat on the table and passes out. Gee, if only we had somebody to come save the day. We see even more guests arriving, but then suddenly the room goes quiet. That's because Mrs. William Backhouse Astor and Miss Caroline Astor are announced. Talk about a moment. And I was really loving what Mrs. Astor was wearing because it really reminded me of the Russian monarchy and the court dresses that the Empress would wear. Like the crown, the necklace, all of it. That is totally the first thing I thought of. We fast forward to the much anticipated quadrille. And I was personally pleased to see that the style of it was modeled after Marie Antoinette, Versailles, and French courtiers from the 18th century. Naturally, the performance goes off without a hitch. But Mrs. Astor makes it very clear that she could easily destroy Bertha after this event is over. Bertha knows this, but she doesn't believe that Mrs. Astor will do it. They're two alike after all. And Bertha can be a very good friend to Mrs. Astor if she'll let her. But will she let her? I'm not so sure. <laughs> and shockingly, even Agnes decides to play nice and give Bertha a friendly nod. Ada is happy to see this, but Agnes makes it clear that they can simply quarrel with her later. <laughs> In other words, let's all be fake tonight and save the drama for another time. As Gladys heads out of the ballroom, Oscar then requests a dance with her. She lets him know that she has to go change first. He's like, oh, it's not a big deal. Just come dance with me and I'll leave you alone the rest of the evening. She's like, you can wait while I go change. I'm out now, Mr. Van Ryan, and I've had enough of being told what to do by everybody. I said, come on, Gladys. Yes, <laughs> let this man know what's up. And then, of course, Tom shows up with Miss Bingham, and I'm so over it. <laughs> he walks over to Marion. Tom tells Marion that he meant it when he said he loved her. But as Marion says herself, and as I also said, sometimes love is not enough. But thankfully, before she can wallow too much in her heartbreak, she is swept away in a waltz with Larry along with Oscar and Gladys, Bertha and George, and Mrs. Astor and Mr. McAllister. We then see Oscar reconcile with John, and Oscar lets him know that he is now in a position to reel Gladys in. I'm sorry, Oscar works my last nerve. And I'm sorry, John, you take the L for getting back with this man. Both Peggy and Dorothy are headed out to Philadelphia to search for Peggy's son. Then we see Mr. Scott arrive home. Dorothy and Peggy confront him. Mr. Scott insists that everything that he did was to rescue both Peggy and the child from a life of shame and that he was only thinking of them. But since they insist on doing this, they'll have to do it without his help. Then we see Marion and Larry and some guests still leaving the party. I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. I was so thrown off because at this point, like the sun is pretty much coming up and it looks like 8 a.m. in the morning. I was like, well, okay, party animals. <laughs> so in the end, Bodan or Borden saves the day or night in this case. And although we have certainly seen what George can do to traitors, he also is one to deeply reward loyalty. He then thanks Borden for his efforts. Borden says, I was glad to do it. Bertha's like, ugh. <laughs> like Bertha is like sick to her stomach and I was screaming. But awkward voice and accent aside, Borden is now officially reinstated as head chef of the Russell household. And lastly, we close out with Ada encouraging Marion. She tells her in spite of everything, this is her home. And that she still has so much more to explore in New York City. 
and so many more people to meet. We then see Bannister and Church politely nod to each other on the porches of their respective homes. And it would appear that at the corner of Fifth Avenue and East 61st Street, everything is officially at peace. At least for now. And that officially closes out episode nine, Let the Tournament Begin. And that also closes out season one of The Gilded Age. Oh man, this has been quite the journey, hasn't it? And I have to say that this was an excellent finale. I don't know what I was expecting necessarily, but it definitely delivered. I would say what I enjoyed the most throughout the season were all the historical references, the dynamics of history and culture and society changing. And naturally, I personally enjoyed all the references to black history. Oh, and the casting, the casting was absolutely on point. And although this whole Ponderosa situation outside clearly made things difficult for the production and shooting, there was kind of a ram in the bush as far as Broadway being shut down. And so all of these actors who normally wouldn't have been available suddenly were, and we saw so many of them come together in this series. In fact, with all of the actors in this cast, they have 32 Tony Awards between them. And of course, a whole lot more nominations. I mean, just Audra McDonald alone has six of those Tonys. If there was anything I didn't like, I've said it before, but that pilot episode was eh. It had me a little worried, I'm not gonna lie. If anything, I would say the writing is what I want to improve the most. As I just said, we have a lot of talented people in this cast. And I think that the writing sometimes, it doesn't allow their talent to fully be showcased. I don't think anything is absolutely horrible, but I just think some of these moments and some of these scenes could really like hit a little bit harder when the writing is on point. I think once that's elevated, I think that'll make it all come together a little bit better because some of it is kind of stiff and kind of awkward and some of it doesn't really work. I also think we could have made a lot more of some of the conflicts and some of the dynamics here. And I'm not talking about melodrama, but going a bit deeper and then seeing more payoff with certain character dynamics, seeing certain payoff with how some of the stories wrapped up. Also, I know this is very, very petty, but I have to mention Gladys's hair. There'll be so many times where I would see her hair and I would just be like, I saw so many people dragging her hair. I usually don't pay attention to things like that, but whenever I saw it, I was just like, okay, can we get a hot oil treatment? Can we get some moisturizer? Can we get a deep conditioner? Like, <laughs> it just looked rough. Some of the characters fell kind of flat for me. In particular, I would say Oscar, Turner, Marion, and Tom. All four of those characters felt very flat and very one-dimensional for me. I really wanted more from them. And it was hard to click with them because it's just like, I don't, <laughs> like, I don't feel anything when these characters are on the screen. And specifically, as far as Marion is concerned, she is played by Louisa Jacobson. For those who don't know, that is Meryl Streep's daughter. And I think because of that fact and her performance on the show, a lot of people are like, mm, nepotism. <laughs> I won't go that far, but I will say that I'm not sure if it's the characterization or her performance or both, but Marion, to be such a central character, to really kind of be the main character, she's not very compelling. But I want to be fair, and there's always next season, so I want to give her a chance. We'll see if it gets better and, you know, we'll see how that character evolves. And as always, please feel free to let me know your thoughts on this finale. Did it live up to everything that you were hoping it would be? Were you expecting more? How do you feel about the way some of these stories closed out? And what are you expecting for next season? Please feel free to let me know down below. And I have to say that I am very thankful for everyone who has subscribed who has commented, who has liked, who has just watched and participated as this series has progressed. 
And I'll be very transparent and say that sometimes with my recaps, because I see so many people like with reaction channels and recaps and so many other things, I see some people who are genuinely like funny and entertaining and just like the life of the party in their videos. And sometimes I'm not going to lie. It feels like I'm kind of like boring <laughs> by comparison. Not that I'm like putting people to sleep, but you know, it just seems like, oh gosh, like I don't have enough energy or I don't have enough of something. But I think that's me being self-conscious and being too much in my head. And I really do appreciate all the positive feedback and all the commentary, whether it's about the show or whether it's about what I had to say and my commentary and so on and so forth. I am very, very grateful and I am very thankful. And I appreciate you guys for, you know, getting on board and being a part of the journey. And until the second season of The Gilded Age comes, once again, this is D Movie Man, signing off, and I'll see you at the movies.